Um, so now we have Steve Scarborough, and he's going to be talking with uh, us about ICS and IoT impact on SEMA. Thank you. Good morning. Everybody awake? All right. So I, I was going to have everybody stand up and do jumping jacks and everything else, get their blood flowing, but this doesn't look like that kind of crowd. Yeah, my bricks on. <laughs> I appreciate everybody coming out this morning. I know it's early. Uh, listen to something super exciting such as ICS, IoT, the impact on CMO. Um, how many of you are working on ICS, IoT, or have familiarity with it? A few, right? It's awesome. Um, so what we're going to do is kind of start out with like a high-level view of what IOCS or I ICS and IoT are, right? And some of the impacts that we had on us recently. So a little bit of the history, um, going back, how it came from. And then, again, that impact on what SEMA, right? How it's affecting each area and where we see it should be going and, and some of those other pieces. If you have any questions, I love questions. Stop, let's talk. Um, again, we gotta go the full hour, so unless you wanna see me do some break dance moves at the end to keep you guys uh, happy, questions are always good. Jumping jacks? I was already doing them out in the parking lot. <laughs> so, um, Steve Scarborough again. I'm the chief technologist in Intelligenesis. Um, my background, 20 years um, in the Navy, I was a retired Navy CTN chief. Um, I started off in comms, and I switched over to cyber, um, NSA red team and blue team, SIGINT development, and for the past 10 years, uh, I've been with Intelligenesis, and um, mainly focused over the past two or three years on data science and how we can apply that in the ICS, IoT world to do anomaly detection and a couple other little cool things. Um, like I said, we're going to do uh, what are ICS and IoT, um, and then we'll get into how it affects cyber operations, EW, and even uh, uh, some spectrum management operations, and, and also the future needs. So a little history on ICS, IoT, and I am lumping those together for this discussion. Um, there, are, there are some differences, there are some crossovers. There are about five million other terms we can reference it by, right, trusted Internet of Things, Industrial Internet of Things, ICS, you know, um, SCADA. It's going to be a very broad term we're going to use today. I don't want to exclude anything from it, but we could go on for days talking about all the little in intricacies about each one, right? But the history, right, um, started with like the first industrial revolutions when we started trying to actually control systems, mainly, uh, not necessarily the first industrial revolution, but Really, when we started looking at power generation, they started really looking at how they can they control those remotely. Um, in the early days, SCADA, get information, how we can open a closed circuits, all those other pieces. Um, I guess I shouldn't touch that button, huh? Right, 1972 um, was one of the first sensors that was developed uh, for monitoring the systems. Um, in the early 80s, does anybody have any idea who in the early 80s um, really started looking at um, trying to control stuff and monitor things with an industrial control system or monitoring system. Anybody? How about Coca-Cola? Right, they put uh, uh, monitoring systems in their Coke machines so they could te uh, uh, monitor the temperature and in inventory so they didn't have to send people around, right? Coke delivery guy didn't have to drive to every place. I information was re reported back to them. They could send people out, right? 90s has started exposing more users to the internet. Uh, looking around, I'm pretty sure like a lot of people remember their first computers, second computers, right? Um, and really started getting people online and communicating. Um, in the early 2000s, there were actually more devices online communicating without humans than there were humans online communicating. Just because of the way the, the, uh, the internet had boomed, people were applying different communications, different sensors, different uh, components so that they can record information and get information back. Um, and, and then those things. Um, 2007, the iPhone came online and really started the next generation ramping up and, and being able to monitor systems and, and, and the communications craze. Um, 2010, right, the Nest was in, uh, introduced. Everybody knows where the Nest is, right? Uh, In-home temperature monitoring or, or uh, HVAC monitoring system, right, really prevalent nowadays. And I mean, a lot of different things, I think this all tied in with like ring systems and Nest and all the other IoT things we have that make our lives easy and monitor the milk in our refrigerator and all those other good things, right? 
uh, about the same time uh, Stuxnet was discovered, right, one of the first big um, ICS SCADA um, attack that had happened, right, still debatable on who and where it came from, but it was one of the first big known ones, I'm going to report it widely. And 2014, Alexa was introduced, right, and really started the craze and started the uh, environment for voice controlling systems um, and being able to get those things working. One of the reasons why I bring that up is because a lot of people don't realize that you can actually work with the SDKs to build um, features and skills into Alexa, right, and open it up to different things. There's ways to kind of get information from that. Um, in 2015, we had the Ukraine power attack. It's one of the first overt um, attacks on ICS or power control or a power grid or industrial control systems. Um, there had been other ones previous to that, but it was like one of the main ones that really brought it to the forefront in recent history and kind of like opened some eyes up and everything else. And at least in our world, maybe not necessarily in the civilian world, um, but it was one of the first ones in the military world that we actually saw this, um, that type of action. And 2016, 5G came online and has really started the, the, uh, a huge boom in IoT. Right? Everything is going to be connected. We're going to be reporting information back. If you're thinking just since then, how many devices have actually come online sans human communications, right? Not just mobile devices, but how it's been applied to vehicles, how it's been applied to manufacturing and robotics and in healthcare and in, in supply chain and, and, and anything and everything else that's being interwoven in is really an enable this to. To, to move data, right, and to link these things in between each other so that they can operate, right? Um, and then this year, um, two big major events, uh, an attack on a water plant in Oldsmar, Florida, and then the Colonial Pipeline hack, right? Um, going after cr critical infrastructure. We have the critical infrastructure um, working groups going on now and the focus from the uh, the administration on how we secure the 16 critical infrastructure areas and, and how all this is going to impact those things. Right? What do we have surrounding this? What is IoT and ICS? It's literally uh, become so uh, intricate and, and woven into our daily lives, right? We don't really think about all the little things that we're, we're interacting with such as light bulbs, environmental control systems that they put into buildings, automobiles, right? Uh, how many people have a recent automobile? You know that your car is talking back to the manufacturer, passing telemetrics information back, right? So and most people don't realize that, that their car is talking, right? They think of OnStar and those other things are, are kind of free. Well, they're free because we're giving them data. Those cars are talking back and all those other things. A point of sale systems. It sounds crazy, but refrigerators um, now coming online and being monitored, right? So we can help uh, buy. I, I, my wife wanted to get one. I was like, I were absolutely not getting one with a camera inside of it because I don't need to know that I, I'm low on milk. I'll just buy milk. Smart TVs, medical devices, and embedded RFID. All these little things that make our lives easy are also making our lives in this environment. Uh, much more difficult for m many reasons. Right. Um, we were talking a, a second ago about the recent events um, in, in critical infrastructure, and that's you know, we had the Colonial Pipeline hack. Luckily, they didn't get to the critical infrastructure piece. Colonial was able to shut them down and only maintained uh, maintain the attack on the um, uh, traditional IT infrastructure, right? It did cause some panic buying, and we saw the impact across almost uh, you know, a good quarter of the nation. As 45% of the gas supply was affected for the South just because of the attack on that one pipeline. And we say one pipeline, but realizing it goes from all the way from Louisiana all the way up to New Jersey, right, across the country, across the South. If, if they had not maintained it or, uh, or kept it from um, hitting that section, we would have been in some pretty serious problems, right? Uh, they still don't know if they made it across to the ice, the control systems, they're pretty sure they didn't, but um, one of the big things we saw from it was the supply chain breakdown, right? Not just on gas, but all the other little things that were occurring. It impacted aviation for a while. Um, it impacted, you know, one of the biggest things my, my kids were talking about was uh, Chick-fil-A sauce, right? 
They couldn't get Chick-fil-A sauce because they couldn't get gas to get into trucks to get it out to Chick-fil-A's. And everybody knows here, Chick-fil-A is pretty important to the uh, economy. Right. Um, had other impacts, you know, delays in, in delivery of other materials and goods and stuff. When we we're already in the middle of a huge impacted supply chain issue as it is because of COVID and, and the, the scarcity of pieces and services and everything else. We had the Oldsmar water treatment plant attack, right? This one, again, um, luckily the operator was in the space, saw the mouse moving and was able to react to it before any damages could be done, right? The water plant services over 15,000 people um, and, uh, and, and in the greater area, in the Tampa area, it would have had a huge impact, not just to those 15,000 people, but does anybody remember what was going on a couple days after this attack? Super Bowl, right? People coming in, even though we were still in the middle of lockdowns and stuff, there were people coming in. You cast doubt on the water supply system in a city such as Tampa or in the entire area, just from that one plant there, you cause a huge problem, right? Uh, loss of life. Now, a couple of these things why I brought these up too is, is they weren't necessarily uh, super elegant hacks, right? These were misconfigured systems or just poorly implemented controls. And that's what we see a lot of times around critical infrastructure, IoT, ICS devices. We go and we buy things off the shelf or we allow, in the old smart, it was the engineers who wanted to work remotely, so they implemented and input the system that they could re remotely access the system. And, but they were not cybersecurity people. They were just regular engineers, implemented something in, and then poorly configured security systems, <coughs> right? Um, we see that quite a bit. Um, the Ukraine attack, kind of the same way, it was, they were notified, they, right before it, well, they, I won't say they were notified, but one of the main operators that was in, in the control room at the time saw the mouse moving again and started to react and couldn't react fast enough, and that's when uh, about 50, one fifth of Kiev's power was lost for uh, quite a bit of good time, right? Uh, there had been other attacks leading up to it, and since then, we saw attacks on the railway system, on, the, on a couple other areas within their power grid, right, and then the other government facilities and, and, and whatnot. Some of these things, again, are just the way we've implemented security procedures around them, right? And, and it's not just in a military operations, it's not just on the critical infrastructure, it's in everything that we do. Um, just last night, I was, is everybody familiar with Shodan or ever seen Shodan? A couple people. If you go on, I went on last night and was looking at it um, and just did a quick you know, query for BACnet. It's one of the industrial control protocols. And I think there's what, 60, 6,600 or so, 6,800 results I got back. Some of those were for um, some buildings out in California. Uh, this one was a little funny, it's the Mandicino County Courthouse. Right, we've seen some military facilities. Um, you're looking at some other pieces. Actually, if anybody wants to see afterwards, um, I can show them a, a, a car wash that I own on my iPhone, right? Because it has a touch panel that's exposed to the internet. Right, so all these little things um, that we input in to help make our lives again easy um, uh, are you know, also exposing us to potential risks and, uh, and, and, and problems. Some of the infrastructure that's surrounding uh, the Internet of Things and ICS now, um, are, 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 we're not going to get into the details of what they are specifically, such as frequencies or anything else, but just so you know, Zigbee, Z-Wave, it's still being fought out. I, I equate this, this uh, um, uh, I'll say, contest of the difference between Blu-ray and, and HD discs in the early 90s. And, Betamax and VHS, if anybody remembers those, right? Still trying to figure out who's gonna win that, uh, went out and, and really push that through. It's implemented in a lot of different places, right? Uh, from light bulbs and smart meters and, and um, we have Wi-Fi, Li-Fi, is anybody not familiar with Li-Fi yet? Or any hero her Li-Fi? So uh, power line communications and cellular, the 5G boom again that's, that's coming out. Well, not coming out, but it is out now. So, 
how is all this relating to SEMA? Right? What are the core tenets of SEMA? Right? Attack and exploit the enemy networks and adversary systems. We need to build and operate and defend our own networks. Right? Gain situational awareness, both in the battle space, whether that's on the ground, in the air, in space, at sea. Right? Mainly SEMA, though, is going to be on the ground. Uh, uh, and protect individuals and platforms. The problem where the uh, IoT and ICS areas come into these, these core tenants are um, we have a saturation of devices within our space. And a lot of times, our operators don't understand that saturation. And when I say operators, I'm talking about the ground troops, and I'm also talking about the cyber folks, I'm talking about uh, supply chain, I'm talking about anybody and everybody that has anything to do with any type of operations don't really understand what is actually happening with all these devices in the environment. We think when you bring a cell phone or we bring in a, a, an Alexa device to your office or, or something else, smart watches, right, into your areas, we don't really think about how that could have an impact on those operations, on the situational awareness, what's going to happen, how those affect our troops in movements, right, how do they affect our devices in movement. Um, everybody familiar with what happened a, f a few months back with the FBI down in Florida? The, the two agents were, were shot. Uh, the, the individual was in the house. They went to serve a warrant to go after them. He actually used, the individual inside the house was actually using a ring device to do the targeting at the door. He could see on his phone where they were at at the door and was able to shoot in that direction, not just randomly, but know that, knew where they were at, right? So we think about how those things are implemented in the new places we're going to in, 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 in ground operations or even in our operations back here for you know, uh, uh, National Guard folks too, if there's any National Guard people, when you have to go into an area and operate. Think about all these devices that we have implemented or, impl or installed in our homes or that they've installed in their homes and how they could potentially impact you. Um, another example I could use is that Nest. I mean, it's not very hard to rig it up for um, a, a, a trigger for an IED or anything, right? But one of the b core uh, pieces or capabilities for it is detect the movement in the house so it can set the temperature based off of that movement. Well, if I'm an operator or if I'm a person, I can just try to do bad things. I can rig it up so that when I leave, I just arm it. And if somebody was to come in the house, set off whatever I hook up to it, right? And most people going into it or looking around or, or reconning or whatever it would, would be would not suspect, uh, suspect that the thermostat is now working against me. So again, increased risks of uh, offensive use against friendly forces, right? Wealth of information for use from the strategic and tactical information. Now this is a benefit to us if once we learn how to harness this information. How many of, how many of, we, uh, of you guys have heard uh, the newest buzzword, data science? Data science, AI, right? Those, those cool things are, are now starting to make its way into the uh, common vernacular in our, our, our world. We have to learn how to harness this information because while it is a potential impact against us, it also allows us to do some things in the space for situational awareness, for preparations of the environment, um, and, and, and finding out information. I do uh, a couple other demos where we, we talk about trying to find gas, right? You're in, in a movement area and you're trying to find gas. Uh, they, a lot of gas stations have intake monitoring systems. Um, they're a simple little a serial to IP um, converter. They house a web server and a mail server on them. And most of the time when they're put into the gas tank, they're, uh, they're not secured and they're publicly available. You can go on Shodan and some other places and just look for unlead or look for av gas or jet fuel and you'll see tons of gas stations popping up, tons of airports popping up that are broadcasting out and let you know right there how much gas they have, what kind of gas they have, diesel, unleaded, premium, right? So being able to collect that information going into an area might provide an uh, operational commander or somebody else some information on, hey, where can I go to get some gas if I'm running out, right? I mean, also lets them know, also provides jump points and things, right, for maybe offensive operations or defensive operations, understanding what can potentially be turned against you in an environment. If I was able to go in and take control of all those devices for a city, then I have a botnet full of uh, uh, these little devices that I can launch denial of service attacks from, right? And you wouldn't normally think of that coming from a gas tank, 
but it can be brought down from a gas tank someplace, right? From that monitoring system. And again, most of those folks, right, um, just running a gas station, trying to get gas, trying to do a service, trying to run a, a family-owned business, don't think that they're potentially adding to the fabric of this problem, right, when they get that information put in there or get that device put in there. Just like the car wash, the car wash guy is trying to run his car wash, but he allows the, because he's exposed it and he has no understanding of cybersecurity requirements for it, he's left it completely exposed and not only can you get on and see his car wash, but you can get into a full Windows CE environment from it, and then his entire network, his point of sale systems and his Wi-Fi network, and all kinds of other information, right? Uh, situational awareness for close-in operations. One of the things we'll talk about, like for future needs, is understanding that piece. There are operators out there that kind of work in this environment and can do some close-in operational type things, but a lot of times we're talking to CPTs and the OCO guys, they still don't understand an industrial control system. They don't understand the intricacies of operating in that environment. You can't take the traditional IT, uh, uh, OCO, and DCO type of methodologies and apply that in the same way you would in, a, in, a, uh, in an industrial environment. There are things that you can do to damage and shut down that system. Like if you ran a, a, a ping sweep like you would for like an NMAP or something in that environment, you could potentially shut down the industrial control systems or the PLCs or the uh, programmable logic controllers that are actually running those devices, right? They're expecting very specific things and if you sweep it, you can shut them down. If we're concerned about how, uh, how delicate some of our OCO operations are and our concerns and our laws and our rules and engagement, then we have to understand those environments too that we have the potential again to cause great harm to the system. And we could potentially set it, shut it down for very long amounts of time. So if our goal is to affect it and not kill it, then we need to understand those pieces as well. Um, those situational awareness too, right? Being able to gain information from those pieces, understand what's going on in the environment before we go into it. We, take, we say quite often, right, with a big, and a big buzzword, buzzword now too is, you know, every soldier is sensor, right? We have all these devices, uh, giving them capabilities to make them more enhanced and give them access to information on the fly, right? We have to be able to harvest some of that information from all these uh, devices within the area, within the battle space as well, and be able to drive that. That's why it's so important really to start understanding what uh, data science is and how that impacts AI, right? So the AI can then become an assistive technology to the soldiers on the ground and to the airmen and to the sailors and the Marines, and even our guardians. Do we have any guardians? Okay, we can cart jokes about them all day long then. You guys didn't find that funny. So a complex electromagnetic environment as well. How many EW folks in the room? One, one only one, two EW folks in the room, right? The reason I bring this up, right, is because of the 5G and the enhanced communication protocols, we see a lot of times that a lot of these devices are being implemented and installed in locations that may not have direct access to, to copper, so they need to get that information back someplace, they're gonna be pumping it over to 5G. Our mobile handsets, all 5G now. Our cars are on 5G. Our homes are gonna be on 5G. Um, another big thing to, to be worried about with in this area too, with the electromagnetic space, is the communications for uh, uh, devices and capabilities on the edge, right? We hear a lot nowadays about uh, uh, AI on the edge and analytics on the edge and compute processes on the edge for these autonomous vehicles that are moving into the areas, right? Um, it's been a year or two since I talked to uh, somebody that was actually here and we've seen it ever since then uh, where automobile manufacturers and other folks that are gonna be putting in autonomous vehicles into areas and us as humans as we start buying, you know, uh, uh, these types of vehicles and getting them on the road, they need to be taught before they move into an area how to navigate that area. So in order to do that, we have to move our, our machine learning and deep learning capabilities to the edge where they're operating at. And one of the ways we're going to accomplish that is by renting spaces in attics and in commercial spaces throughout the areas and embedding you know, advanced um, edge computing devices, and NVIDIA's working on this a lot, um, to be able to take information from vehicles moving in the area learn from it and move that data back up the line to co vehicles moving into the area so they know what's going on in that as they move through. 
we don't want AI making determinations on what's right and wrong at the time that it's learning it, right? So we need to teach it beforehand. Um, with that, we have a very large amount of, of information traversing that electromagnetic spectrum, right? Um, as we move into more, more space operations, right? That, that area, that information is, is becoming more and more contested, right? As we, and we need to be able to understand that as well and how those industrial control systems in space are going to function and, and operate. Um, everybody's familiar with Starlink? putting thousands of satellites in space to blanket the earth in, 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 in communication so we can you know, uh, bring it to sub-Sahara, right? To regions in the US that are, are, are not capable of reaching high speed uh, data pathways. They will now be able to do that as it moves into those areas. They're gonna start bringing stuff online. Same thing is happening overseas in those areas. They're gonna be getting it and they're gonna be becoming part of that whole spectrum of information and communication. Um, it's also pretty important to understand too that right, we don't want to shut our own comms down. As we implement these same capabilities um, to be able to communicate and pull data back in a secure and safe manner, we're working at the same, uh, uh, in the same space as all those civilian devices as well, our, our adversaries' devices, right? And putting us closer and making the determination on what is what is and isn't a uh, friend or foe in that electromagnetic spectrum makes it even more uh, um, difficult to operate at those, at those things, right? And then, you know, spectrum management effects. How do we then manage those pieces in that environment for communications, both traditional, non-traditional? You guys have any questions so far? Making sense for everybody? So how does it pertain to specific to, to areas such as cyberspace operations and offensive operation, right? Oh, I'm sorry, in the, in the cyberspace operations area, we have OCO and the DCO area, right? So for offensive uh, purposes, right, some of the big areas that we can, we're looking at ICS and IOT is, again, gonna be that, that operational preparation environment, OPE. How do we shut things down? How do we affect things so we can move into the area effectively? How do we understand what's there? How do we protect our troops as we move into the area uh, uh, and whatnot? And that's, you know, uh, before that's been looking at like Wi-Fi networks and, and such, but now well, not all these devices are online and 5G, right? Cellular networks, how do we give those capabilities out to not just special ops guys and gals, but how do we give those to the normal everyday troops that are moving to the area? How do we, how do we enable this information and that data to commanders that are moving troops and supplies um, through the area so they understand what's going on, right? And with the OPE piece, we can help prep that and guide some of those other things. Close in support. Uh, I mentioned a few minutes ago, but a lot of our offensive folks that we've talked with have zero experience with close in support or close in activity on inter, uh, ICS devices, right? They go in, they'll see a PLC, they don't understand it, uh, and most of the time, uh, we've been told they're just like, we'll just cut the wire, cut it off, right? How to get information off of it, right? And that, that could potentially have other ramifications in that building or, or other things in the area, right? So they're, they're just like, uh, they don't understand those pieces. So we have to get those operators up to speed on it. Um, traditional IT cybersecurity, right, does not cover just those PLCs and, and industrial control systems again, and SCADA networks and all the other things that we, that we can say that are non-traditional IT um, in this environment. We um, continuously see or we talk to them about um, how to pull information off, get that information, how to be able to put information or even you know, affect the information and flow. Defensive considerations, one of the biggest ones we've seen and talked to folks about are the uh, unintentional insiders, right? And, and, and a lot of these things are just people not understanding what they're bringing into the environment, right? How many, how many of you have looked at your, your troops and seen if they have all have like smart devices and trackers and GPS devices and everything else is coming in? A few, right? But there's a lot of folks that, that don't, and 
who don't understand, uh, um, again, what the huge impact is on all these devices and facilities controls. I won't name any names, but there's a pretty big uh, group in South Carolina, and we actually found their facilities control and contacted their defensive folks, and we're like, hey, I can see your building control system for your HVAC and your electrical system. And they're like, we don't know what you're talking about. They're like, well, we can shut down your building. We need to take it off the internet, right? And they still didn't understand. That, that was two years ago, you can still go out and touch it. It's still online, right? Because they just don't understand that impact to it. One of the things we've tried to demonstrate to the DCO folks is when they see anomalies, right? If I was a, if I was a, a threat and I had a, 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 I needed to restart a server someplace and I couldn't gain access to it, you know, or I've lost access to it, but I have access to the thermostat in the room, I could just turn the temperature down to the point where they need to shut the computers off and then bring the computers back up, right? So we affect those things, environmental considerations, right, around buildings and stuff getting them to react and do things that I wanted to do. Understanding the uh, uh, interactions between um, the devices and HMIs. Is anybody maybe not familiar with HMIs? Everybody's seen an HMI at least once I know, right? The human machine interface on your thermostat, right? Your touchpad, everybody's staying, well, a lot of people staying in hotels. My hotel room's got a thermostat with a pad on it, right? Um, you go to log in someplace. Your iPad has a, a remote control device, right? You can you see those on there. Being able to intercept those communications and, and, and provide fake information to it to show that the system is operating normally, or even that it's not operating normally without touching the system, to be able to get them to react to it and do something differently, right? To be able to escalate privileges or to be able to identify pieces where I could potentially go to an attack or see how they're gonna respond if I do shut the things off, right? Um, and actually affect the system beforehand, right? So I know what they're going to do. The group that we, I was referring to, um, one of the things that we found with that was is the person who installed it, right? This, this um, a contractor from another city quite a bit of the ways away, right? He had also installed it in three other buildings in the town and they had the exact same configuration as the uh, military building did. And so we looked at the other buildings and the way we knew it was because in the configuration information he had listed out who they were. Right, he gave us the name, he gave us the name of the facilities, right? So we were able to go and look and see where those pieces were at. The one building that it was installed in was a museum, right? And it actually told us what, what, what room it was installed in in the museum. So if I was a, a, an adversary, I'm gonna do all my prep and, prep and planning on the one in the museum because I know the guy at the museum is probably not anywhere near as skilled as the military folks, right? that are supposed to be in this other building, right, doing the defensive operations. Go and prep everything there, and then move my attack over to the, the, uh, the, the one that I really wanna go after with very little uh, uh, problems, right, and training and everything else. Um, one of the other things, too, we, we've seen is, when, uh, we t I briefly touched on like data science -y type things, but all the open data, not just in Shodan, but in other places throughout the country, throughout the world. You can go on to opendata.gov sites, and there was one, and I was out at the uh, Joint ICS Working Group uh, about two years ago, working with some folks, and we found this listing that Kansas City provided called the uh, Dangerous Buildings Database. So we went in, about 10 lines of code, we were able to map out all the buildings that those labeled as dangerous, and then start looking at the infractions that they had inside of there and be able to identify buildings that were condemned or, or old. And the, the ICS guys that were in the room with me, they were like, well, so what? I'm like, well, what, what do these buildings probably have or most likely have nowadays? Probably smart meters, right? So if I wanna operate against smart meters, now I have a list of locations where there's people not in them. I can physically go to that location and, and take a look at it. I can remotely try to get into those systems, right? And I can, now that I know that Kansas City has this database, I can start looking at much larger municipalities throughout the country and start gathering that information about dangerous buildings where smart meters are probably installed at. And now I can start going after them those, those directions. You shift those TTPs and that information that the governments are providing, right? Municipalities and, and companies and everything else, they start looking other places we might be operating and they're providing some of the same information now, right? Um, we 
found, I, through, through some research and everything else, we actually found a building in Palestine, right, that had all the facility controls, his power, his water, his lighting system, his HVAC system, all completely open on the same exact panel that my car wash guy has, but just a different HMI, right? So, and lo lots, of, lots of ways to find those pieces. So no, um, some of them might be, right? Larger companies might, might be of that mindset, but most of the ones we're seeing nowadays um, are, are not, they don't understand those pieces. We, is, we in this profession, in this community, and, and even the larger corporation stuff, we get annual IT training, right? Cybersecurity training, change your passwords, default passwords, all those, those the generic things we take for granted. But if you take a, a, a an HVAC technician or an electrician someplace, they're not trained in that, right? So when they get a device from the manufacturer and the default password is set, they just install it and they just go. The supply guys and the facilities folks, they don't understand that piece. They just go to the IT folks and be like, hey, I need an IP address for this PLC or for this facilities control device. And they go, okay, well just here's this IP and they put it on and the next thing you know, it's on and reporting. Do they add it to the scene? Do they add it to reporting? Do they understand, right, what to look for if it's not alerting? Right? We have lots of rules, but to, to alert on traditional IT threats, but on the industrial control system side, the IoT side, not that many. There's only one protocol, um, uh, uh, Modbus TCP, that's in you know, the first 1024 most common IP addresses that you do a scan for, like if you don't configure anything. All the rest are outside that range. But do we have rules set up to alert to folks that are in that area, right, when they're monitoring systems? No, right? So, yes, all the way in the back. And there's devices, like he, like he was saying, you know, the manufacturer are pumping it out. It's not a traditional cybersecurity mindset, right? It's just a, a, a consumer thing, like get it out, get it operating. You know, make our lives easy. On the facilities control, it makes our lives easy that I don't have to monitor the, uh, I don't have to go to every thermostat. I can remotely access them any place and, and put it in. I don't have to go out and, and run a dipstick down in the fuel tank to tell how much gas is there. I can just look on my, my phone now, right? But I don't think about, how that impacts everybody else in the area. Some of the scenarios we ran with folks was like the gas station. I'd be able to jump from the gas station and tank monitor systems to the Wi-Fi network, the Wi-Fi network to every move, every person that's coming into the gas station, and that to over to the traffic light system to a bank across the street, right? You can use that as a jumping off point and accelerate through, and nobody's really watching that piece. It's, a, it's an unprotected vector. We look at the infrastructure, email servers and domain controllers and web servers and databases, but we don't look at all these other things with the same criticality to be protected at because it's just a thermostat. It's just a, a way for me to turn my power off when nobody's in the building, right? So there's different types of things. We have to, that's one of the things we work with a lot is trying to bring those folks in and educate them on that. Um, supply chain, right? Our supply folks have to become more aware of it. A lot of times they'll go online and we try to look for the cheapest thing Right, at the best price, but do we really do the analysis on the devices and the embedded pieces that are in that, those devices coming into our facilities and into our operations and into our equipment? I'll say a lot of times, no. Right? Even on, on, even on co everyday common things, we don't look at it. 
Um, one of our one of my counterparts ordered a device. It's a a, a, a wireless uh, switch, so you can just click it and turn on and off lights and everything else. You hook up the light bulb. It's batteryless. It has a small little generator in it, right? It sends the signal out Bluetooth, so every time you click it, it connect it generates enough electricity to send the Bluetooth signal to turn the light off, right? When you click it again, it sends it off to tell it to turn it back on. When he received it in the mail, he bought it off of Alibaba, of course. Uh, when he received it in the mail, right, it actually was labeled on the shipping as a beer can shower holder. Right, so they were able to ship it in from China, get it through customs, get it uninspected, go through uninspected anything, and get an electronic device that now nobody knows anything about except the end user, and we don't understand those pieces. Our supply guys do the same thing. They order something, they try to get it bought from someplace. We don't ever track down those same chips that they use inside of those, those devices are embedded in thousands of other places. Right? Um, we have a demo uh, um, that we do where we look at a, a Pi Raspberry Pi hat. And on the Pi hat, it has a temperature sensor, it has a humidity sensor, and has a barometric pressure sensor. For years, we've been using this device. And it wasn't until recently we actually put it under a microscope and realized the barometric pressure sensor on the, on the hat itself actually had a hole in it. Right, we looked at it under the microscope. We're like, why, why has it got a hole? And it started making sense. But we couldn't figure out you know, exactly how we were able to affect it. We, we, we shoot a laser at it and we can change the barometric pressure. We weren't sure how we were actually able to do it. And as our research it, it moved on, we started thinking, oh, well, maybe it was because of the hole, right? that's on the chip itself. Maybe, maybe we're affecting something in that way. So being able to look at the, that level, right? How often do our supply guys do that? Ne never, right? Any other questions or concerns or anything so far? Right, electronic warfare area, right? The market, like I was saying, is still trying to establish the standards, right? We know we know 5G is, is, is coming or is here already, and we know the equipment, we know those standards, but when we look at how things are being embedded in the homes and in the uh, buildings, Zigbee, Z-Wave, these mesh networks that are being put into place, the, the, um, the mesh networks for smart metering, right, and how big of a mesh network those are and where they're touching at um, becomes a, a, a big area of concern. Building capabilities, right, they're constantly putting new things in and still in, in a very competitive market space trying to get those things in. But as we move into developing capabilities for it, right, how do we, how do we uh, uh, work to be able to address which one's going to come next? I, I, like I was saying, like how do we prep for the, the, the upcoming fight between uh, uh, Blu-ray disc and HD disc, right? right? Do we have, have separate com uh, uh, components right, that, are, that are coming in out of there? Um, there's uh, adversaries use versus civilian uses of the electromagnetic spectrum they have to be concerned with, right? Some of these devices and some of these capabilities are coming on online, right? They're going to be using the same things. They're going to be using, you know, I, 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 I don't joke about it, but I call it, it's going to be like a, 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 an ICS shield, right? IOT shield, right? Being able to hide behind something that, that's there. Um, we've seen this in other places throughout the world where they'll just take and copy full full infrastructure pieces off and implement it within the cellular network, right? And it looks like you'll see a cellular network someplace that looks like Tacoma, Washington. And you're like, what the heck happened there? And like, well, somebody, somebody got the configuration file for it and, and put it someplace else. And you're like, you know, reuse of IP space, right? We've seen that quite a bit, right? So being able to disguise themselves in those environments, being able to make it look like a normal everyday home device that's being operated someplace, Right. How do you tell the difference between a nest that's actually being used by a friendly person and a nest that has a potential ID rigged up to it, right, or is reporting information someplace else? We have to be able to look at some of those things and see and, and do some anomaly detections um, and do some kind of blanketing of the area and data collection and understanding what that environment looks like from, as a whole prior to going into the areas, right, and being able to segregate those out um, beforehand. Spectrum management operations. I, I like to joke that this is probably the least uh, appealing aspect of SEMA. Any spectrum management folks? One person. All right. Uh, the, the the biggest problem here is 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 
the communications, traditional communications, right, and how we're implementing these devices in that, in that spectrum to be able to operate as we move more capabilities, again, to soldiers and, and equipment into the area to be able to get data and receive data and, and, and process data and everything else. How do we move that, that data around, right? Uh, uh, the volumes of data that we're gonna be moving um, within that space then become successful, right? As we're taking information from, from a tank or from an aircraft or from a power generator or, or from a soldier in an area, right? Pulling back information. How do we aggregate all that? How do we protect it? How do we know and trust that data is, is, is proper? If, if we were to try to collect the ICS and IoT data from the size of a city, say, of New York, what does that look like? And how, how, how horrible of an attempt it would be for us to try and manage that um, if we, we weren't prepared for it? And everybody, everybody's familiar with, with uh, Twitter, right? And I like to use Twitter as, as kind of my baselining of volumes of data that we're actually talking about. Um, anybody know like one of the top people on Twitter? Anybody? Maybe Kim Kardashian, I think, was like one of the top people. She has like a, a hundred million followers. Every time she tweets something, how many tweets is that? Anybody? Anybody want to take a guess? How many points of data does she generate every, for every tweet that she makes? A hundred million. If she has a hundred million followers, she generates a well, at least 100 million points of data because that tweet goes to Twitter and it goes out to all their devices. Now think about this. She has 100 million followers. How many devices do we have in our normal everyday life? Two to three. I got a cell phone. I got a, maybe a tablet. I've got a, a, a work computer. I got a home computer. If I'm logged into Twitter on all those, now for every device that the person has, multiply her tweets by that many, and now we have that, those pieces. It doesn't. It doesn't sound like a lot when I say she tweeted something, but when I say we, we want to gather all, I'm not advocating getting all her data because it'll probably be horrible, but if we wanted to gather and store all that data someplace, that's 300, 400 million tweets every time she does something. And now every time one of her followers does something and retweets it, that's three, 400 million points of data that she's constantly generating. Put that into a city the size of New York or even a city like Augusta here, right, where people are constantly generating data all the buildings are generating data, the vehicles are generating data, right? And we're trying to aggregate all that into a specific space so we can have a very good understanding before we move into that space or even protect that space, right? For, for the National Guard folks who want to protect the, the, uh, uh, the, the electromagnetic spectrum and the cyber spectrum and everything else that's in this environment, all that data, right, is going to be needed to be able to, to do it in a proper, efficient manner. Um, applying uh, uh, AI to that problem, right? A lot of times we all will be sitting here and talking to managers and, and, and capabilities, or people who need capabilities, and you know, the big thing right now is AI. I need AI. Well, to be able to get AI, we need data, right? We need to be able to run the deep learning models and the machine learning models in an efficient way and enough data to be able to work and, and operate that AI properly, right? Or to implement it properly and to help augment our decision making properly. So how do we gather all that? How is it all affected and, 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 and pushed, right? The spectrum management is going to be very critical in that space, right? Friendly IoT capabilities, right? How do we implement the friendly IoT capabilities and ICS capabilities within that space in contested spaces and within the friendly spaces so that we can operate as we move into environments? How do we, how do we protect our, again, how do we protect our pieces and our, our capabilities while allowing friendlies to operate in the same space and denying adversaries um, access to it. I don't put a whole lot of information on here about space because it's still you know, uh, um, in, in a developmental stage, I will say, but it's something that you know, I know the uh, space, space Force is looking at and, and, and trying to start embed in. They're pulling some capabilities over from the Air Force um, uh, um, folks and they'll be pulling it from the Navy and the Army as well. So it's just something they have to understand as well, right? As we start moving more data back and forth um, in that environment, how, is, how the IICS, IoT um, devices and capabilities are implemented in, in those vehicles and in operations, right? And how they're gonna support us back here uh, on the ground, right? Uh, future needs, right? And these are just a few of them, 
and we've kind of touched a little bit on them uh, uh, um, going throughout the, um, the talk here, but for operators, right, we need multidisciplinary operators, and I'm a big proponent of, of, uh, um, uh, of our OCO guys being uh, or doing tours as DCO folks as well, and vice versa, the DCO and the OCO. They have to understand these pieces. We have to um, start looking at, you know, I, uh, I'm probably a little more opinionated in this than a lot of folks, but the DCO world of, of cyber ops doesn't get quite the attention as OCO does. OCO is the, the big sexy in the room all the time because it's, it's what shuts things down and, and executes things. But if we look at DCO operations, it's what's going to protect and uh, allow us to do those things in a more advanced way. We have to get them better training and we have to get the OCO operators better training too, especially in the area of ICS and IOT. Right? All those things, right? We can't just look at it as a traditional, you know, I'm not gonna spear fish some, uh, uh, some PLC, some place to shut the power off. I'm, at, I'm gonna need to go after those things and discover those pieces and shut the power down or, or, or do something else. What are the effects on the rest of the building? Right? Is there a, a medical facility that I'm going after? Right, or that they're going after. So we need them to understand those pieces to be able to operate in those environments to, to both protect and to attack if necessary. Um, our special operators, I know, you know we have some operators are, are close in support, but as we look at, we're not, I'm not just talking about uh, um, you know, Delta guys or spec op guys, but what are, what are we looking at for our everyday normal boots on the ground folks? Right? Putting a cyber operator that understands these types of things in with them so that they can help move through environments and contested environments, right? How do we protect them? Um, how do we help them protect the uh, um, civilians in the area, right? Understanding how all these things operate, right, before we start putting these things down, right? Um, a data analytics, um, volume, volume, volume. Does anybody know what has surpassed oil as the most valuable commodity on the planet? Data. Right, so data has become the most valuable commodity on the planet. ICS, IOT, right, it's going to be or is um, a huge part of that data, right? We have to be able to um, look at how we gather the data, how we analyze the data in, a, in a, a, an effective manner, how do we apply, again, the deep learning and machine learning, right, to augment the AI to help us get through all this data. Our operators just can no longer be reliant on being set in front of a scene, right, and looking at an alert. We've all heard about alert fatigue. You start adding in ICS and IoT devices into that environment, right? They're gonna get even more fatigued on seeing all these things and, and understanding them. Deep packet analysis on, the, on these devices are much different than deep packet analysis on uh, uh, a packet carrying HTTP or, or email or, or uh, queries to the database. So you under, need to understand those, those things. Um, understanding ladder logic and how the devices are actually programmed down to the firmware level, down to embedded uh, um, devices. Um, I, I, we joke around about being like super data scientists and analysts. They're gonna have to understand, right, what CNO operations are, right, both OCO and DCO, so they can pull those pieces into it. They'll have to, the operators that we talked about previously, right, they'll have to pick up data science skills to be able to operate within the data environments, to be able to make sense of what's going on, anomaly detection, Right, being able to pick out pieces that might be uh, uh, being affected. Um, we talked about artificial intelligence, we talk, touched on it briefly. It's not the panacea for problem solving, right? There's a lot of work that goes into artificial intelligence, right? That deep learning and machine learning, understanding how we get data, how we analyze the data, how we then move that into being done more uh, um, aut automatically for us, right? And automating the data analysis piece and data acquisition piece of it so that we can develop out, right, that assistive artificial intelligence um, and be able to make those things. Again, machine learning and deep learning capabilities at the edge are gonna also be important, right, as we move these devices, as we move, give uh, uh, soldiers on the ground capabilities, you know, uh, the hollow lens, everybody seen the hollow lens? Right, it's the augmented reality headsets that Microsoft is, is putting into play, so as we deliver that data to them in their hollow sets, Right, HoloLens as we pull data back from them from there, right? How do we adjust those? How do we pick algorithms and pick machine learning models and deep learning models to be able to apply those and not just 
um, and, and prep, but also in near real time too, be able to adjust things and, and move things around uh, and, and help them. I think, I think we're getting close. Anybody have any questions or anything? Oh, there's a couple in the back. Blue shirt, yeah, we'll go blue shirt first. So, uh, yeah, I think I, I think it'll be at some point in the future, not not in the near future, that it will reach that that piece. Um, but I don't. I think that's going to be a long ways off. And I think right now, what we're looking at implementing AI in the environment and is, is is again, a lot of folks have that idea of like, oh, it's going to take over a job, or it's going to take over, and it's going to be able to fully operate on itself autonomously and, and make decisions for us. Uh, right now, we're looking at AI as more as an assistive piece to what we're doing and, and maintaining control of that. That's why it's so important with like the, the capabilities at the edge, right? We can only teach those autonomous vehicles so much in a controlled environment. We need wild information being processed at the edge and giving it back to it in almost near real time so that it has a better chance of making the correct decision. Right? We can teach it what a stop sign looks like, but when it moves into areas, the stop sign move, there's other like red things in the environment that could be throwing it off, right? And I need it to stop. I need it to tell it, hey, there's other things in this environment, right? So, but it's gonna be, you know, in with the human as well. Same way in, a, in the applications we see in the military places, augmenting DCO operations, augmenting OCO operations, augmenting decision makers in the battle space, right? I mean, not making them, and I, I would not advocate for turning that over to any any machine right now, anyway. So, hope that answers your question. Right, it, it has to be trained. We have AI. We can't just just drop AI capabilities in the field. It's got to be trained on what we want it to do first. I think that's like a misunderstanding a lot of folks have is like deep learning, machine learning, right? Really comes before AI. And, and the data scientists and data analytics are occurring and then informing the AI how to make those decisions based off of that machine learning and deep learning. Yep, yes. Yes, sir. Yeah, just, th that's one of the things we were touching on was, was like, th it, it is a very thin line in, in that area, right, on where those things are going to cross over at. And, and again, not understanding it fully, where those touch points are if we start affecting different things within operations, whether we're prepping an environment or we're actually trying to use it ourselves, right, that's where the biggest piece is. And we have to pay, there's going to be a lot more research in that environment, a lot more testing and a lot more capabilities development needed in that space to make sure that we can really, really target the things we want to target for protection and for uh, um, effects, right, in, in that space to deny, for denial of services and for maintaining services for ourselves. Uh, qu another question up here?
So not just uh, anomaly detection, but um, really being able to aggregate that data in an effective manner. You know, we start again looking at millions of points of devices across the city, and, and, and we look at the power grid in the United States. There's literally millions of points, right, of, of pulling that information and being able to understand that, being able to see how it's operating on a normal basis, um, identifying um, different aspects, being able to make recommendations on what we need to do to defend those pieces, um, being able to take that so the same models and looking at other countries, other areas we might be moving into to help understand what it truly is. And then also being able to pull in outside information, not just about those sensors, but how do we aggregate other data sets and, and other points of uh, interest into it so that we can make sense of what's actually going on and, and make a better picture for operators and decision makers. Thanks. Any other questions or concerns? All right, there's many, many more areas, right, we could discuss. And we could go on for days, you know, talking about AI and IoT and ICS and OCO and DCO operations, right? It's going to always be changing. Uh, one other thing we have to be really uh, mindful of is how ag agile we, we need to be in this environment, right? Because it is constantly changing and our adversaries are picking things up. So with that, there's no other questions and stuff. If you guys want to see uh, um, a hands-on demo of some things later on, we're going to be over at the uh, uh, clubhouse this afternoon. Come over there. Uh, grab a beer, grab something to eat, and, and play around with some ICS and IoT pieces. You know, I'll even let you shoot a laser at something and change the temperature and humidity. All right. I appreciate it. Um, and I think we're two minutes over, so you guys are free to go. Oh. I'm sorry? It's, yeah, GCC1 on the third floor. No, I appreciate that. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. No problem. Absolutely. Okay, cool. Yeah. We were just teaching a class for the CPT out in Hawaii. We did a, um, an intro to ICS, and we also did a data science class. Yeah. It was in Mac back. Yep. Oh, okay, yeah. That's cool. awesome. Yeah. Oh, one. Have to uh, link up. We, we're in Virginia, so we're right in Columbia, in Maryland. We're building out a, a, a ICS lab and data center, and we're going to be bringing in 